Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the Vent webinar series. Today, we have partnered with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for a presentation on birds of the world and how it can be of value to you and our travelers. Birds of the world is one of the greatest resources available to birders in the natural history community. Leading this presentation is our special guest, Laura Kammermeyer. Welcome, Laura. Hello. She is the business manager for Birds of the World and a figure well known in North American birding community. She will deliver a live demonstration of Birds of the World. Joining Laura is Vent COO Barry Lyon, who will demonstrate how Birds of the World can enhance your knowledge of birds and help prepare you for the next Vent tour. At the end of the presentation, we will announce an exclusive discount opportunity for the VENT community. Afterwards, we will open the webinar for a live question and answer session. Now we will turn to Barry Lyon for his opening remarks. Okay, thank you, Ben. I want to thank our audience for joining us today. We have over 100 people uh, registered for today's presentation. And I, I just want to begin my remarks by, by commenting on the importance of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the work that it does. Um, it is widely recognized as the premier institution for bird research, study, and conservation, uh, certainly in the country and most likely in the world. And, you know, for a number of years, Victor Emanuel Nature Tours has had a relationship with the lab. Uh, we have been honored to be able to operate uh, private trips for its various donor groups, um, and you know, and an array of other things that we do and support. We're continually looking for ways to partner with the lab uh, in meaningful ways because of of our uh, of our belief in the the work that it does. Um, I personally am a member of the lab's Golden Wings Society, and if you uh, in our audience here, if you yourselves are not yet members of the lab, we strongly encourage you to do so. And of course, uh, the Birds of the World is just such a wonderful resource that we're going to hear about today. Just before we uh, turn it over to Laura here, I know that uh, Victor Emanuel, who has joined the presentation, would also like to say a few words here too. I've been birding since I was eight years old. and There's never been anything in my life like Birds of the World. Mm -hmm. I, I have the, the books, but they have it online where you can study the birds you're going to see before you see them and more about their lives and the history of the birds and have it with you on the trip. So after you see a bird that afternoon or that night, you can read about that bird in Birds of the World. Nothing like it has ever been done before. It's an amazing development in the history of birding. I really encourage you to sign up for it. All right, thanks, Victor. Now we will turn to Laura for the live demonstration. Great. Wow, that means so much coming from you, Victor. Um, we're just so pleased to work with you guys. Um, you're our favorite. There's a reason why the lab only trusts you with our donor groups. So thanks for all the work that you've done and, and for everybody and leading smooth, amazing tours. So thanks for inviting me on today to talk about Birds of the World. It's a project that means a lot to us. And, um, you know, we, we believe that the foundation of Birds of the World is about promoting conservation across the world by providing the most up-to-date um, exhaustive resources on every species in the world. Because in order to save a species, you have to know a species. So um, that's what moves us every day to keep growing the resource, to host the resource at the lab and, and have this network of people who are, who are growing it. So let me tell you more about it as we go here. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, can you all see my, my homepage here? Yeah, we see it. Great. All right. So first, let's start out. For the people who don't know yet what Birds of the World is, I just want to give a brief overview. At its simplest, it's a website that contains comprehensive life histories of all the world's birds and bird families. So it contains 10,906 species profiles, as well as a profile for every bird family, 249. A more complicated but essential answer is that it's an online research platform. That, uh, that brings together deep scholarly content from several celebrated works of ornithology with millions of bird observations from eBird, plus millions of pieces of uh, multimedia assets from the Macaulay Library. And it brings this all into this single platform. 
and is currently in use by biologists and birders in more than 125 countries. So again, this is the, this is a, just a quick view of one of the ways that you can get in to see your favorite species. We call this the Taxonomy Explorer. And if you click on one of these groups, you learn about the various bird. This is the California condor. Or going back, we can also take a view of one of the family accounts. And this happens to have one bird in it, the Sagittaria Day, that has the, um, the secretary bird, wonderful bird. The history of birds of the world is interesting, a little bit, little bit complicated, but very interesting. It's, it's a melding of many resources into one. So let me just go over that briefly, because it kind of does matter in how, the, how all of the content on the site has developed over time. There are two longstanding, or actually three longstanding resources out there that existed first in print form, uh, Birds of North America and Handbook of Birds of the World are, you know, massive resources that took up, you know, linear feet of space on shelves. Birds of North America was a 13 volume set uh, containing 700, I think it was 766 species accounts. It eventually went online. Handbook of Birds of the World contained a brief overview of every species in the, in the world, and that was developed by the folks at Lynx Editions, which is a publishing agency in uh, Spain. And that was a 17 volume set that took up feet of space. And they also went, uh, went digital after some time. And so the Birds of North America and Handbook of Birds of Life, um, HBW is what we call it, HBW, um, Alive or Digital, Neotropical birds came along and those were digital accounts for, I don't know, I think it was around 1,700 species. So we put those together with a, a book called Bird Families of the World. Um, this is written by experts in bird families, um, David Winkler, Sean Billerman, and Irby Lovett. And since then, you know, we, we integrated that with Macaulay Library assets and with eBird. And over time, some, some of our partners started adding more information. So the Internet Bird Collection, which contained a lot of assets from, from Europe and Africa, were, were added. That would be, what, 241,000 videos, as well as the Oriental Bird Club image database. They gave us another, you know, a couple hundred thousand uh, assets there. And just recently, we're very proud to announce that we have a, a working relationship now with Roberts 8, and they wrote the Birds of S Southern Africa. And so that group is now revising their Robert, Robert 7 book, but instead of putting it to print, like waiting till it's done and putting it to print, what they're doing is actually putting their content straight to Birds of the World once it's written. So that's all very exciting stuff. Um, we're really happy to be to be working with with them. We have a big team working on Birds of the World. We have a you know science team that's housed at at the lab, a very small science team. Um, but we also have the um, consulting associate editors around the world that are helping us uh, organize, find new authors, organize authors, and overall, you know, over the course of this 20, 25 years that that it's been live, that it's been live. Um, that all of these accounts have been developed, there's more than 2,000 different authors out there. And we're also working with partners all over the world. So, so this is truly a collaborative effort um, hosted by the lab, but really the work of many. And we'd like to point that out. When you go to Birds of the World, you know, there's a couple of different ways that you, know, you sign in, and then there's a couple of different ways of, of looking for a species or a family. So you can use the search bar at the top or on the front, and you could also, when, when you're signed in, look at all of the recently updated accounts. So when I click there, I go to a page like this with all the accounts that this, this uh, editorial community, this network, has recently released. And we're releasing around four to six different um, accounts every week. And so the birds that we're working on are not only, um, well, th they're just global, right? So we've got birds from New England, we've got the Crested Caracara, we've got the Northern Flicker, something from home. Um, the Connecticut Warbler, which is a favorite, this is probably the closest I'll ever see one in my life, <laughs> although I've tried and I'm sure a lot of you have too. Um, th but that was recently revised as well as Tropical Net Catcher, Rock Martin, which is a bird from Africa and the Middle East. And again, the, the yellow-browed 
bulbul is from the southern tips, southern southeastern tips of India. So when a new species account is released, you can read the revision notes, and this will tell us uh, something about the community of editors that contributed to the account. And this one just happened to be uh, in partnership with an organization called Bird Count India, which is a fantastic organization uh, that is really using all of these tools, just taking eBird and Macaulay and really trying to, you know, make it their own and doing fantastic work in producing producing data, tools, and reports that are having an influence on conservation in India. So we're really happy to work with them and they're fantastic authors. So it's that that partnership is going really well. One of my favorite birds is the golden collared mannequin. And when I read this account, I just love it more and more. First of all, look at how gorgeous this is. The, the golden collared mannequin is a, lek, a new world lek forming species found in the region extending from Panama to Colombia. And if you've never heard of a lek, it's it, lekking, lekking males gather together in a small area called a court. And they clear the leaf litter off the floor and sit on the branch and perform this elaborate display from the branch in order to attract females. So in this case, the males will jump rapidly all around the court and then drop down to the forest floor. And with each jump, the male snaps its wings. And let me just give you this quick video here. And it goes almost too fast to see when, when they snap their wings. And when you have all of these males in the court, it just sounds like somebody has set off a string of fireworks. I want to let you know also that in addition to the photos and videos at the top of the page, you can find the key video plus the key sound for this species. So the data, well, the, the, the multimedia that we have up here are what we call the essential set. And what they do is they reflect, how do I put it? They reflect that species, um, representative photos and videos and sounds of that species over time and place. So it includes male, female, juveniles. Sometimes it shows regional variations, like with the red-tailed hawk, we have all of the regional variations and also seasonal variations as well. So, so this, just even going through this top essential set gallery, really gives you a great idea of what to expect in the field. But you can learn a lot, lot more by diving a little bit deeper into the account. And the account has features the entire life history of the bird. And when you get into things like the identification details, similar species summaries, you could look at systematics and find out what subspecies they are, there are. And in fact, what's neat about this is that when there are subspecies for a for a species, it gives you not only a separate image, in most cases, a scientific illustration, but it also gives you, it pulls out information from our Macaulay library and gives you images for that subspecies. So if there are like real subtle differences in that subspecies, you're going to be able to review it here. Now, this subspecies work is growing. This is a feature we just released Golly, I would say six to eight months ago, and our authors are are working fiercely to f to fill up some of the more narrative descriptions. But where there are subspecies and where there's photos in our Macaulay library, you will find them there. So that's very interesting and and really helpful tool. Um, there's also information on hybridization. So what's neat about this bird is that it hybridizes with uh, particularly the white collared mannequin. And in fact, what's um, this species, let me go north here in the genus Mannequis. Th there's this gorgeous set of white collared mannequin, the orange collared, golden collared and white bearded. And at one point, I believe all of them were, were, were in a single species, they're all lumped together as, as in something called a bearded mannequin. So these are these little details that you can learn. And then this definitely makes you a better bird or more aware in the field. Um, back when I was traveling more frequently, I was frustrated because I didn't have an understanding before I went into the field about what I was looking at. And a resource like this would allow me to 
to have a basic understanding of what to expect because when you're in the field it's too it's too much it's overwhelming especially in the tropics as you know so being able to do some advanced study um you and seeing the bird in habitat and all its plumages and learning a little bit about um you know the natural history of the bird is really useful so another thing i wanted to point out you know that goes deep into behavior breeding phenology, which is basically understanding that bird through all of its season, that's really important. Um, you also have a separate multimedia section, and this is definitely always worth uh, clicking on because um, it gives you a lot more multimedia. And in many cases, there's the, the authors have written a caption, a detailed caption that, again, tries to put that image in context. And in this case, it's a possible confusion species. The adult male orange collared mannequin is often confused. Um, it has a deeper orange yellow collar and a stronger yellow wash in the, in the green belly. So again, it just makes you a better birder. It's, it's an overwhelming amount of content, but you know, sitting back every night and, and you know, doing a little bit of research as you go you know, in pre preparation for a trip is, is uh, going to be very helpful. I want to point out a few other things. We're going to go now to the Canada warbler, another great species that many of us can see here in, in the eastern half of the United States and Texas, of course. Um, I want to point out again some of the, the connections to eBird. We've seen a lot of the multimedia, and that's coming from our, our Macaulay Library. And of course, as an, if any of you are eBirders out there, you can add data, but of course you can also add media. Uh, so if you go to your desktop, you can add a photo or a, or a sound recording to your images and all of that lands in our library and it has incredible use. Scientists are using it to study, you know, study things like the evolutionary, uh, the evolution of feather color in birds. There's a lot of research applications for the Macaulay Library itself. But then it also then comes in and is used with our other, other projects like the Merlin app. The same essential set is often the same as you'll see in the Merlin app, okay? And so we've talked about Mer um, Macaulay Library, but let's go over a few really neat things about how this connects to eBird as well. So if you see this area over here, it's called an eBird badge for lack of a better word. And this tells me whether I've seen, photographed, or took a sound recording of the bird. Now, I don't do a lot of photography and, and, and audio work myself, but I have seen the bird. So if I click on seeing the bird, what it does is it takes me to all of the checklists where I, where I recorded this bird. So the last time I saw it, I was in Maggie Marsh, Ohio on May, 15, on May 2015. It makes me sad. I should see that bird more often. But that was it. And I can actually click on that and then learn more about what I saw that day. And if I've made any personal notes, I can also see that there as well. So that's a really neat feature that helps you kind of, it's almost like traveling through your life list. And what it does, for, for me, I kind of see it as my legacy, right? I have my children and my, my home, my family, but then my birding legacy is now all stored here in this system where I can not only see, you know, connect my eBird history to the birds here, but I can read all about their stories and, and quickly connect to my story on my eBird checklist. So all of that is um, kind of a really thrilling thing for me personally, and you might enjoy it too. So there's one, um, so that's one way that eBird is connected there. Um, often our maps here are created by different sets of folks. Uh, sometimes it's from eBird data alone. Sometimes they're from um, Robert Ridgely and the, and the older NatureServe project. Um, and sometimes they're from BirdLife. So there's a couple people who contributed to those, but these, these um, simple range maps are really just send home, you know, a clear idea of, um, of where the bird is throughout the seasons, okay? And I also want to point out here, these are 
I guess you call them hot links to Ebert and Macaulay Library. So if I wanted to review all 343,000 um, observations of this bird, I, 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 could, I could. But if I go to recordings and I can go to um, the photos there, and then there's one more place that I wanted to show you. Under the movements of migration, we always kind of wonder how and when the birds move. That's a big thing that I look for all the time as I am waiting for the birds to come in spring. I'm like, well, how early do they get here? Where are they now? And this can help you get a better idea of that. So this is an animated map that's based on uh, um, eBird data, right? So here we are watching the bird as it migrates southward into south south or northwest south america we see the dates right here and it quickly gets up all the way into canada and comes south again so this is a really fascinating you can also if you, you know if you watch this let's stop it at july 20th look let's go back one so it's july 27th today right so this is about where i would expect the Canada warblers to be right now. So that's a real fun tool that I, I find really critical as I'm sitting at home waiting, <laughs> waiting for the species to show up. So those integrations are really what set Birds of the World apart as an online resource, and I hope will you know, be very useful for you. A couple other things I wanted to point out. Again, you know, you could Let's go right over here. Excuse me. You can go straight to the family family and learn more about the Perulidae, or you can go to the genus and find out there. Uh, you can do, uh, uh, this is basically just a wheel that takes you in taxonomic order through all of these species. What a bird. <laughs> it's fantastic. And this right here is what we call the surprise me button. And there's one on the homepage too. You could just sit there all day and kind of just um, click through and have fun seeing if you can identify the bird. If you're, if you're, this is all the birds across the world. So I think that's hard for most of us, but I'm, I'm sure there's somebody in the field guides crew that can, could have a really good, um, really good idea of most of the birds that they're seeing. So, so that's fun. Um, I want to show you now to one of the things that one of the services that the lab provides is con continual annual updated taxonomy. So every year the taxonomic authorities come out with, you know, splits and lumps and new species. And it's our job behind the scenes to update our entire database for eBird, for Merlin and for Birds of the World. So essentially, we've built the back end of these things that they're all connected into a, to a simple taxonomic, well, I wouldn't call it simple, but <laughs> to a taxonomic backbone. And so when that information is released, then we update our site to reflect those changes. So last year, Eastern Meadowlark at, um, was split into Eastern and Chihuahua Meadowlark. Now, there isn't much new material written on the Chihuahua and Meadowlark here. There's a lot more. There's a lot more we can learn about how that species differs. But when you want to look at the the systematics history of that in Eastern Meadowlark, here's a place that you can go. So about every no November is the time that we publish these new splits and lumps, and we also hold a webinar where our taxonomic team. Um, which includes some of the world authorities, including uh, Tom Schulenberg and, and who just retired, but Tom Schulenberg uh, just retired, but he's been on it. Pam Rasmussen and Marshall Eiliff are lab people who are, who are represented um, on the world, um, I think they call it WGAC taxonomic group. Uh, so that's something interesting. And Ruva Weaver was an interesting bird that, that got on the list last year. And it was first described as a species in 1891. But then all of a sudden, people started calling it the African Golden Weaver. So it sort of got lost to science over the past hundred and some years. And then they finally realized that, yes, indeed, the Ruva Weaver is actually separate from the African Golden Weaver. 
So that came back on the books in 2022. This was another bird that that was um, that was put on the list last year. It's called the Aller Mizomela, and this is found um, in the Indonesia area in a very 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 small um, archipelago. Archipelago. So uh, that's that's kind of fun to look at the site late November December when some of these new species have come out. Um, let's see, one other thing that I want to show you is, is the, again, the explore taxonomy feature. When you click this, you basically have all, you know, 11,000 species accounts, but you can filter this by your region. So if you want to um, filter, you can filter down to county if you're in the United States or Canada province. Um, so I'm going to do Monroe, um, New York. So instead of saying county, I'm just saying Monroe, New York. And this is giving me 365 species. And that'll be really useful for your home-based birding. Um, but if you're going to Peru, then you'll see we have about 1,882 different species to look at, OK? And we're going to be doing a better job and how and being able to fix that regional filter over time. It's it's on our development list. We just haven't got to it yet. But this is a way that you could say, oh, well, you know, let me study the grebes of Peru and open each one up and then study them. Of course, you could just go here as well and study them more broadly across the globe. But, you know, there's a couple different ways of looking at that. And if you click here, I want to show you that you can, you actually have the whole taxonomy here for you and you can search the text here. Oh, one really important thing. Now, some people are so keen on this and I think I'm going to be growing more and more um, interested in, in using this. But the, if you see this tiny eye, it's so easy to overlook. But if you open it up, what you have is is data from the key to scientific names, and this is a this is a, a scholarly tome written by James Jobling, and he's just a, a scholar at studying the the meaning behind scientific behind behind the scientific names of all species, and so he's when we when we launched, he said, "You really ought to be the place, the home." for the key to scientific names. And so we worked on an arrangement with James and we're very glad that he, you know, he trusted us to work with this information. So what you have here is, is the, the name, but also what they call the original description. So J.F. Miller was the first to discover this and, and document this bird. And it also includes um, the protonym, which is the first, the first legitimate name of a taxon and on which the currently accepted name is based. And it also tells us that the type locality for this species was in Tierra del Fuego. So that's um, a lot of information is embedded here. It's, it's really thrilling stuff once you start getting into it. So, so yeah, I think that concludes the general tour. I know really fast, but I wanted to just, you know, give you the, the broad based overview. And then it's really great that you know, um, Bent has been able to sponsor you guys at uh, a discount for your enjoyment of it. So I think with that, um, we can stop sharing the screen and we can talk about the next step. Back to you, Ben. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for that, Laura. That was was amazing presentation, uh, especially the migration map. Yeah, that's, that's one of the greatest features that um, you know, Ebert has been able to put out. They're they're working, and just just so you know, Ebert is is producing these maps apace, and there's about 2,200 species for which they have that map for, and those maps can be developed where you have enough data and birders, birders birding, and data collected on those species, and they're very exhaustive maps with a whole lot of layered information inside, and but we're on pace, you know, to we keep going and we're hoping that we can um, um, 
just keep growing. I think we get maybe 600 new maps a year or something like that. So not every species has that, but almost all in North America and many others. So again, about 2,200 different species and maybe more. So, you know, if it's not there yet, you just keep looking, especially if it's a species that is in an area that's well birded. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, this is Barry Lyon here again. And um, in just a moment, I am going to, to uh, further emphasize how birds of the world can be of value to you, specifically to event tour that you might be preparing for. It really is uh, the birds of the world application. It really is just such a, a, an outstanding way to supplement the no your knowledge and preparation for a tour that you might be uh, thinking of signing up for or are already registered. Okay, I believe everybody can see my screen now. And what we are looking at right here is the VENT website. And I am going to use three examples. Uh, there are many examples that I could show, but I'm gonna show three and this sort of follows in line with the information that Laura provided. So I'm gonna start with our Colorado grouse tour. Example number one is our grouse tour. And this is one of our most special and also most specialized uh, departures that we offer. This was a trip that we developed about 35 to 40 years ago uh, by one of our longtime tour leaders, Kevin Zimmer, who had the idea of putting together a trip that focused almost exclusively on seeing as many of North America's grouse species as we can in a single trip. This is about a, this is an 11 day departure that always operates in the first half of April. And uh, it's really we really have no other trip like it. And a lot of that is due to the fact that the grouse, particularly the prairie grouse, are among the most remarkable groups of birds in the world. I'm actually going to show briefly here our let me see if I can show our route map here. This is a map of the route that you run, but in particular, uh, off to the right side of the screen, uh, we are, where you're looking at where the route enters the state of Kansas, this is where we go to see the lesser prairie chicken. And so I'm going to flip to the itinerary, which I would click under read more if you're not familiar with our website, but I already have it pulled up over here. This is our itinerary. Uh, here again, the route map is featured, but one of the things that we do fairly early in the tour is we go, uh, we go for the lesser prairie chicken. Here is a photo of the bird. And the lesser prairie chicken, uh, unfortunately, is one of our most, is a bird that is among the most dramatically reduced in numbers of our native birds uh, from their traditional ranges. And as a matter of fact, uh, you may be aware that this bird made the endangered species list uh, back at the end of March, so only four months ago, um, uh, of course, is kind of a good thing and also a bad thing because it signifies that the species overall is not doing well. Um, and so when you when we target this bird, uh, this is an, an objective is seeing this bird among a number of other species of grouse. Uh, one of the things that you will want, you will learn about is the bird's preferred habitat, its numbers, something about its breeding cycle. And, you know, for, for a number of people, of course, who take our tours, just being on the trip, reading the itinerary will be sufficient for them. However, for others of you who might really want to do a deeper dive into this species, uh, which, of course, is a very special bird, and so it's worth learning more about, and the information that you might be seeking extends beyond what is in what is available through the vent itinerary, through a traditional field guide. Now, yes, your tour leaders are going to know some of this, or in some cases, a lot of this, but the information that is available about this bird, um, among many others, of course, is here on Birds of the World. Now, I'm looking here uh, this is the species profile, and if you look off to the right side of the screen, you will see the bird's, um, the bird's uh, range map. 
And this is a bird that historically did not have a massive range. Uh, a big part of Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, southeastern Colorado, and eastern New Mexico. This bird at this time is not, let me see, wanted to take a look. This bird at this time uh, has reduced, has been reduced in numbers quite substantially in all of these states, and its stronghold seems to be now in western Kansas, which is why we go there. So here's your introduction, a nice overview of the species, talks about some basic facts about the lesser prairie chicken, what is known about it. And then off to the left, here's this whole suite of items uh, that fall under the overall profile. And there, you know, a person may or may not be interested in every bit of this, but there are some things that are going to stand out. For example, um, there is this section here on identification which will tell you how to separate it from the remarkably similar greater prairie chicken. You can drop down a few lines to distribution. Again, that's the map that we're looking at here. And I've blown this up so that you can see what is considered to be the year round distribution presently in dark purple there, but in lighter purple, or I guess that's lavender. That's the historic range of this bird. And so you can see that this thing has really become quite reduced in numbers. Dropping down, you can learn about the bird's habitat. Right off the bat, it tells you sand, sagebrush, blue stem, and shinnery oak blue stem vegetation types. This is a bird of the short grass prairie. Uh, second sentence here, currently most common in dwarf shrub mixed grass vegetation associated with sandy soils. I'm just sort of demonstrating the information that's available here. Uh, here is dropping down another couple of items. You get to movement and migration, and it can tell you how the bird moves around or not within its restricted range. And you know you can just keep on going. Here's some information about the bird's sound, vocal behavior, um, dropping down to breeding. Uh, this will tell you pretty much you know the the core the core information about this bird, uh, the, 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 the time period when it nests, how long the females incubate, how large of a clutch size might it have, when do the chicks fledge, and so on. All of this under nests, eggs, and I could keep going on this if I wanted to, but then down here at the end, the conservation status of the bird. This is a bird that Again, because of it, the loss of native uh, habitat, the use of pesticides, um, these are various factors that have contributed to the bird's decline. All of this information is here at your, for your perusal. I am now going to switch gears to our Midwest Warblers too, the second of three examples that I'm going to give. This was a tour that was developed by Michael O'Brien and Louise Zemitis um, about I want to say six to eight years ago, and it was a tour for that was designed specifically to see as many species of warblers as we can on a single outing of reasonable length. This is, I think, a, a nine-day tour. Um, let's go down and take a look at the route map here, and as you can see, this tour starts uh, at the bottom of your screen. This tour starts in Cleveland, works across the northern tier of Ohio, up well up into Michigan, before coming back down to Detroit. And up here in Michigan, um, particularly in this region of the Huron National Forest, this is where they go to see the Kirtland's warbler. And if you know something about this bird, or if you don't, what I can tell you is that this is among the most uh, range restricted warblers that we have in North America. Um, the Kalima warbler in Big Bend is it's the, about the only place to see it in the U.S., but that species does breed in Mexico as well. Uh, the, the Kirtland's warbler, um, the last time I looked at it, there were about 3,000 individuals, I want to say, 3,500. But at any rate, here's a beautiful photo of the bird that heads our itinerary for this trip. And so, you know, clearly there is an expectation and a hope that people who take this tour can see this very special bird. 
Well, what is it about this bird that makes it so special? Well, why don't we flip over here to birds of the world and we can again take a look at the species profile. Here uh, on the right side of, the, of your screen, you are seeing a map, the range map of this bird where it breeds. North Central Michigan, there are, it, there are a few of them in Ontario, Canada to the west. They are in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this bird has done pretty well, mainly because uh, it's, it's almost its entire existence is tied to the management of the jack pine forest uh, for which this, this species is tied. And it does, it does winter in the Bahamas, uh, just uh, well off of Florida and at the top and at the north end of the Caribbean. So, uh, because of this bird's unusual life cycle, uh, I thought this would be a good example. Again, each of these birds, their species profile is arranged identically. So, once you develop a familiarity with looking for birds on the Birds of the World application. You can quickly scroll to certain things, certain items that may be of more interest to you than others. There is a, as always, there is, it leads with um, a section on identification. You can drop down to distribution. And with this screen, you are seeing the eBird map uh, right below the illustrated map above. And, you know, this is what's what's beautiful about the eBird maps is that it offers greater precision in terms of knowing where these species can be found. The illustrated maps, the colored maps, they are, as Laura said, they're 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 a product of the eBird maps. But with eBird, you are getting you can drill down to uh, a, a greater level of precision in terms of where people are seeing these things. Um, Dropping down here to habitat, the lead sentence here, the habitat in the breeding range, it nests in dense young jack pine forests on nutrient poor sandy soils, primarily in glacial outwash ecosystems of Northern lower Michigan. And there it is. And when you take this tour, or if you have on your own seen the Kirtland's warbler, you will you will readily recognize that habitat type because it's most unusual. Um, that, and if you read on, what you'll, you'll also understand is that you'll come to understand is that those jack pines are fire dependent. And so the human hands-on management of this ecosystem makes this whole thing quite unusual because this is one of these birds whose entire existence, its breeding existence is tied to proper habitat management. So uh, movements and migration. This is a bird that flies across the continent more or less directly from its breeding grounds to the Bahamas. On occasion, it will be seen somewhere en route, but most of the birds make that big flight uh, without stopping or with not more than one or two stops. Um, Continuing on, let me see here a bit of information about the breeding, in particular its nest. Uh, you know, for those of you who this this bird actually this species nests on the ground, and here it tells you uh, under nest construction the female shapes the loose sandy soil into a shallow cup by rotating her breast against it, and then you can read on and it tells you the eggs, the actual size of the eggs if you're interested, egg laying. Uh, incubation, fledging, all these things. Here under incubation, it tells you that the average period is 14.2 days. So they, so the, the, the female sits on the, the nest for two weeks and before the eggs hatch. Interesting. And again, the point of this is that it adds further, it, it contributes to your knowledge and preparation for the birds that you might be seeing on a tour for which you are registered or are considering registering for. I am for our last example. Uh, the first two I have shown you concerned uh, birds of North America. Something a little more exotic is our Papua New Guinea highlights tour. I chose this tour because it actually is operating as we speak. 
And uh, our tour leader down here, Max Breckenridge, sent us some really neat photos the other day of his having of his group having had a wonderful encounter with this amazing bird called the Rajiana bird of paradise. And here is a photo of it, a, a rather dark photo of it on our website. Uh, if I click over to our tour itinerary, here is that bird in full display. And because the birds of paradise are uh, unequivocally among the most remarkable group of birds in the world, and the Rajiana paradise is certainly among the most spectacular, even within that group, I thought it would be nice to use that bird as an example here. So this is a bird that is found entirely on the island of uh, New Guinea, uh, within the, the country of Papua New Guinea. And um, you can see, here's your illustrated map. Underneath it are your eBird maps. So again, that greater level of precision on where people go to see this bird. And as Laura was pointing out, there are uh, there is an assemblage of photographs of images that undergird this species profile. So you can see, I mean, this is <laughs> this is an extraordinary bird. I know Victor has seen this bird. I have personally not been to New Guinea myself, but I know Victor has made at least a couple of trips, I believe. Um, there's the female, and here's this bird with all of its remarkable plumes, more photographs, so you get the picture here. I don't want to belabor this, but uh, again, there's just so much that you can glean from each of these species profiles. Uh, again, uh, here's a treatment on the field identification, how you separate males from females, why it's not certain other species. Um, you can look at the bird's habitat. And, you know, because New Guinea uh, is a mountainous country and a lowland country, you know, you might be, if you're signed up for this trip, you might be wondering, you know, so you've gotten to New Guinea, now where do you have to go to see this bird? Well, it tells you here that this is a species of the lowland forest, hill forest, and lower montane forest, secondary growth, forest edge, gardens, and casuarina. So this species is more opportunistic uh, and pragmatic in its preferences for nesting areas. And um, it's got a fairly widespread distribution within its overall limited distribution, if that makes sense. Um, you can learn about the diet and foraging, what this bird eats, and again, learn something about its breeding cycle. So, you know, I could keep going bird after bird, but uh, I'm going to stop right there. Um, the point of this was to be able to draw a straight line from the birds of the world application to how a subscription to this service can also serve to add value to your vent tour. Ben, I'm going to, I think, turn it back over to you. Uh, All right. Thank you, Barry. That was a great, wonderful demonstration on the lineage between a mentor and birds of the world. So now we'd like to open up the floor for questions uh, from the audience. If anyone has any questions, feel free to share them in the chat or the Q&A of uh, your toolbar on the right. Barry, you did a fantastic job um, describing how you use it. So thank you for that. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Laura. And, and again, uh, we'll take this opportunity to thank you uh, for taking time from your busy schedule to work with us today and to present to our, our, our travelers. Mm -hmm. It's a development in the history of birding, and I'm delighted that Cornell has done this, and we're delighted to be able to make this available for people. Thank you so much. All right. Here's a question from Barbara. Uh, is there any way to narrow down the explore taxonomy to a region of, say, Colombia? Yes, indeed. Um, I, I showed that. You might have missed it. Should I demonstrate that again? Yeah. Or do you guys yeah. 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 Do you want to? That Please do. Be great. Okay. So share screen window. Okay. Let's go back. 
So when you're at any page in the website, it's going to say Explore Taxonomy here at the top. So just click that. And if you go to Filter, you can say Columbia. And now you have 1,900 different species from Columbia. Um, this, is, this includes any bird that had been recorded in eBird there. So uh, then you, you can pick one. Like I said before, um, it's, it doesn't fix, the, fix it to region quite yet, but that's a, that's a meaning if you start um, traveling around the site, it doesn't fix it to Columbia completely. Um, it kind of stays here, but, um, but it's a start and we'll be improving that sometime, I'm hoping in the next year. We have a question here that's uh, similar to this or uh, related. Uh, Marilyn says, thank you for this informative presentation. Is there a way to interact with birds of the world to pull from different species into a grouping? Um, the best you can do is use that filter. So uh, the only way you can group is by region or by conservation status or both. So that's a way to group species in this type of um, visual explorer field, okay? So again, if we do Peru, uh, if we wanna look at the endangered birds of Peru, we can click here and we're done. And so we see that the white-winged guan and the wattled coroso are quite, you know, it, are endangered in Peru, according to the IUCN, which is a global authority. And um, this is kind of helpful in that, you know, sometimes when you don't know a place far away very well, you don't know what's why a bird is special. I remember, okay, why is this special? <laughs> is it rare because it's, you know, really range restricted because that's just the way it evolved? Or is it really rare because it's threatened, vulnerable, or endangered? So using that conservation filter can really help you uh, get a better handle on, on you know, that part of uh, that that question of, of why it's a it's a cool bird it's it's special for whatever reason. And, and Pam has a question about uh, the search feature. Mm -hmm. um, she said, "Is it possible to use the search feature to find current name of bird you saw in the past, but are just now entering to historical data?" That is such a good question. Right now, no. Right now, the search filter only accepts the current name of the species. But there, but we know that that's something that we need to be able to allow. And so we're creating at some point, hopefully within the next year, we, we wanna create a place where we, where we feature the taxonomy on the site, the Clements taxonomy, and then we would have links to previous taxonomies as well. So that is, I know it can be, can be a little bit frustrating if you don't know the exact name of a bird. Um, but if anyone else has, has gotten around that some other way, let me know. But I do want to point out this. You, there is a preference ex, preferences ex, um, section. And if you happen to use the English IOC, you're, you can actually go to English IOC. And IOC is a different, a different taxonomy. So it's possible that it's um, based that you know, that your, what the old name that you're using could still be used by the IOC. I'm not really sure how that works, but, um, but that's an option as well. And so depending on where you're at, we have about, so, well, wow, it went from six to like 12 different versions of English. So if you're from the UK or India, or if you're just used to the old taxonomy found in HBW, this is a possibility. This might get you there. I can't guarantee that it will. <clears throat> But often what I do in that case is I just search for that bird using the name I know on the internet and I go for the scientific name. So I try to find the scientific name. And when you put in the scientific name of the bird, then you're going to be able to find it. Lisa has a question, is the billing cycle one year? So it's a, it's a recurring billing cycle. So it's like a subscription service. So you'll get, um, so your coupon will apply to the first year only, then it goes up to $49 a, uh, a year for the subscription and you're getting it at 34 for that first year. 
Uh, Barbara wonders, is there a way to link Merlin's Explore Birds feature to Birds of the World? Uh, thanks. This, this would be very helpful. Oh, yeah. That would be helpful. Um, at this point, there is not that linkage. But over time, again, as, as we get the, the, like the development resources and time to, to work on those kind of linkages, we, we really want to try bringing these tools together. Uh, Ruth's comment uh, question says, curious how individual state or other more local bird references might link or be added to birds of the world. Um, so is that, is that, would that be more so through eBird with citizen science, those records add to, um, yeah. So how is the question, how can people contribute to birds of the world? I think so. Okay. Right. So lots of opportunity depending on, you know, depending on your skills and interests, right? If you are a scientist who has special expertise in a bird, you can reach out to our editorial folks and we could find a way for you to be involved. There's a lot of accounts that need to be updated. So this common nighthawk was last updated in 2011. If there's been new research, new science, new data on this bird, we'd like to update the account. And people could either adopt an entire account or they can just add something about vocalizations if that ha happens to be what their expertise is in. Um, but my guess is the, the writer was talking more about eBird data. And when it comes to eBird, you can put, when you put in your, um, your data points for you know, bird observations, ultimately that's going into models that the eBird science crew is developing for the eBird status and trends, for those migration maps, or seasonal abundance maps. I don't even think we showed you that one, um, but also these these simple range maps. So so although that's you know you can't really know and see exactly your point, um, you know, possibly you can on those purple range maps. Um, so that's one way, but also the multimedia. Um, let's go to to this. So all of these are housed in what's called the Macaulay Library. And so Macaulay Library is this huge resource with millions of different assets. And just over the last couple of years, we allowed people to submit to the Macaulay Library through their eBird, um, their eBird checklist. So you know what? Maybe I should just demonstrate that. So I'm going to go to my eBird, I'm going to look for, let's see, I wanna find, actually, I know how to do it. Let's do it this way. Let's go to Shoebill. Who's seen the, seen the Shoebill out there? I love this bird. <laughs> and this is one of, the, one of the birds that I have photographed. So I saw it there, let's, um, If I click on that, you can see the photo of the bird. And then if I click on my checklist, I find that, you know, there was a bunch of birds that I saw in Uganda that day and I can manage my media here. So if I happen to be, you know, years later looking at my checklist and I want to add more media, I can use this, go back to that checklist and just add the photographs as I find them. So that's something that a lot of people just love to, to work on over time and we really appreciate it. So those images um, in the Macaulay Library, there's the ones that are best quality are the ones that are then used and brought in and curated by our editors. Um, the editors will pick the most representative in terms of appearance, in terms of seasonality, in terms of behavior. Um, so we're really interested in species um, you know, high quality images of the species up close. We're interested in uh, the species as it's flying. We're interested in species doing things, you know? That's what a lot of people kind of overlook the importance of eggs and nest photos. That's something that we're really hoping people will contribute to um, spend more time contributing in the future because um, a lot of these 
we don't know very much about how birds nest, especially in the tropics, you know? So um, there's a lot of photos that can ultimately be, be brought into Birds of the World through those means. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, Lisa says, great tips, marvelous offer, awesome amount of info. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amy asked, do you need internet access to use the subscription? You do. Yeah, a lot of people have asked us to put this into an app. And, and truthfully, there's, there's just too much here. And there's too much interactivity in order for us to put the Birds of the World material into an app that could possibly work. <laughs> um, so, so at this point, it's not going to happen. But but there is the Merlin app that already exists, and that's that free um, bird ID app that offers basic information. Like I said, that there, there could very well be some growing opportunity for us to connect these, some basic information from birds of the world to Merlin, things like similar species and deeper ID information could eventually make its way into Merlin. Uh, Bruce asks, can you filter by endemic species of a country? Wouldn't that be great? Um, but no, at this point, you can't. Not yet, but some maybe in the future development. You know, yeah. that, that I have a question about a lot of uh, our audience has had questions with some enhancements of this application. Is there a way that they could submit ideas? Oh, yeah. Um, so please just go down to the Contact Us area. Uh, let's see, where is it? Down here. Mm -hmm. Contact us and use this form. And, you know, uh, it's me and it's actually me and Jessica who who monitor this box. And so we'll make sure that your ideas get passed on. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Valerie uh, asks, can can this resource be used to create a life list? Not not really the way that it currently the way that it represents your life list is that the badge for a bird that you've already seen will show or not show. So this will light up blue, um, but, but it's not possible at this time to export it. Um, we, you know, we're focusing a lot. We have limited resources, as you know, it, um, it's pretty tough to do everything that we know that should be done. And we really want to meet the needs of both birders as well as scientists, because this is, you know, the key tool used. If anyone's studying birds, this is kind of like the place that they start. There's a lot of information, not only about the history, but it's fully um, referenced. And I didn't mention that, but let's go to breeding, for example. Um, it's fully referenced. And so you can click on one of these and go back to the original paper where that was, uh, where that was, um, that information came. So that's really cool. And references here as well. So our Golden Eagle account has 700 references. <laughs> our Golden Eagle account was 200 pages long for Word. And that's another reason why we can't put this stuff in, a, in an app. There's other ways that we can do that. Well, very good. This, uh, I think, concludes our question and answer session. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. And I want to thank Laura and Barry and Victor for an amazing presentation. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or, or any ideas, because we're really open to hearing what, you know, what, what people need and want. And like I said, it's a great tool for science and birders. And we're trying to kind of please both, both communities and, and just broaden the, broaden the access to people around the world. So thank you so much for having me on. Take care.